Welcome, everyone, um, to our, our second cafe of this, our eighth season of Archaeology Cafe. It's hard to imagine we've been doing this for eight years. Um, I see some new faces tonight, so I just want to briefly go over our format. Our speaker um, is going to speak for about half an hour and give her presentation, and then we're going to open the floor to questions. Really, one of the best things about Archaeology Cafes is the question and answer sessions that go back and forth with the crowd. Um, just as an aside, I was working in Albuquerque this weekend, and I ran into a bunch of graduate students from UNM, and they all talked about how much they really appreciated the videos that we're putting online, that um, even graduate students are, are finding these, these videos helpful. So I, we're really quite proud about that. Um, so tonight we have Catherine Dungan, who is going to be speaking on um, a subject near and dear to many of our hearts in archaeology. And um, really, it's a great night with perfect weather, and really the best time to ask a graduate student, or really an archaeologist in general, any question about their topic of study is right before their comprehensive, or not before their comprehensive exams, right before their, their defense. Um, she will be defending in 10 days, and she is at the top of her game. So, no pressure. No pressure at all. So, for those of you who aren't aficionados in Southwestern archaeology, uh, let me very briefly define what a great kiva is. Uh, so, again, if you Recall the, uh, the topic tonight is something about uh, historical interpretation of great kivas. Um, so uh, kivas are a religious or ceremonial space used in modern pueblos that we also see in the pre-Hispanic past. Uh, they're very often excavated into the ground. And when we talk about great kivas, greatness in this sense just means big. Um, we're talking about very large religious or ceremonial spaces that we see in the pre-Hispanic past. Um, I'm going to come back specifically to my great kivas shortly. Uh, if you are an aficionado of southwestern archaeology, when you hear great kiva, you might think uh, primarily about really big circular structures on the, on the Colorado Plateau, like you might see at Chaco Canyon. Uh, I'm not talking about those great kivas. I'm talking about rectangular great kivas, which were built uh, in the central southwest, that's uh, east central Arizona and west central New Mexico, between about AD 1000 and AD 1400. So I'm going to get into what I mean by a historical approach here very shortly, but first I want to ask you to think about uh, one particular question, which is what does religion do? Um, and I'll, t I'll tell you straight up uh, at the beginning, this is a trick question, but what does religion do? If, uh, if you were a Southwesternist writing um, for a very long time, or any archaeologist who's really studying non-state societies, your answer to this might have been that religion is integrative, that religion brings people together uh, within or across communities, that it creates a sense of community, uh, or that it in some way naturalizes the social rules of a community. Uh, this isn't a bad model. It wouldn't have stuck around for so long if it was a bad model. This makes sense in a lot of ways. But I'm going to argue tonight that it's a very flat model that really limits our options for looking at religion um, in the past or anywhere, really. So, <sighs> I've totally blanked there. <laughs> this is what happens when you're about to defend. We know people disagree about religion, right? This, this shouldn't be that surprising a thought. We know people disagree about religion. We know people disagree about big building projects. Um, even if something is intended to be integrative, there's no guarantee that it succeeds. Just because you build it, they might not come. <laughs> and on top of that, even if something is integrative within a specific group, that can be the exact same thing as it reinforcing differences between groups. So, and finally, the uh, the basis for religion as bringing people together is often based on this idea of religion as um, having a sort of deep, timeless authority, right? Um, and that's really a problem if you want to look at how religion changes through time. And we know it does. So how religion changes through time, and if religion can drive social change through time, and we know that happens too. So these are the ideas that I'm really hoping to explore by taking a different approach to the, um, to the discussion of great kivas. 
Now, this study specifically, um, as Doug said, this comes from my dissertation work. Uh, I, I, I first approached Great Kivas in sort of a weird spot. This is if you followed Archaeology Southwest to work, you know that we did field work in Mule Creek, New Mexico, um, in the Upper Gila for several years. And in 2011 and 2012, we excavated at a site called Fornholt, uh, which has a structure that's very like a rectangular Great Kiva. Um, it's kind of odd in a bunch of ways. And it's actually at the very southern edge of where you might expect to find Great Kivas during this time period. Um, so I'm particularly interested in Great Kiva change in contexts that you might think of as borderlands or frontiers. So particularly areas that are particularly very social diverse um, and how that social diversity relates to Great Kiva change, how it might inspire experimentation in what people are doing with their religious practice and their religious architecture, and again, how that plays into what these might have to do with social boundaries. Okay, so, um, and I, I, sh I should warn you, because, uh, because I'm a dissertator, I could go on at great and tedious length about this, and I'm going to do my best not to. Uh, so we're dealing with pretty big strokes in a broad history tonight. Um, so hang on to your hats, because we're going to go through some history pretty rapidly. Um, so what are these great kivas like? Um, first of all, if you look at the map on your handout, uh, the distribution of rectangular great kivas that I'm talking about, again, this is after 81,000, um, you see an area that I would call the Eastern Mogollon Highlands. This is the um, San Francisco and Blue River Valleys, right on the edge between New Mexico and Arizona. Um, this is also sometimes called the reserve area because of the chief town in the area, sometimes called the Pine Lawn Branch because of a place that saw a lot of um, excavation in the mid 20th century. So that's kind of the heartland of this rectangular Great Kiva tradition. There are a lot of them there. They're very dense there. We also see Great Kivas on, um, along the upper Little Colorado River in western or eastern Arizona. And particularly late, we see a few Great Kivas cropping up um, in the Arizona transition zone, the Arizona mountains, over at Grasshopper Pueblo, Kanishpa. And there's a very long tradition of Great Kivas at Point of Pines Pueblo. Um, I'm particularly interested in the ones, in a lot of ways, in the ones in the Eastern Mogollon Highlands because they're closest to where I work, um, at the very edge of the Upper Gila there. But, so what are these great kivas like? Um, well, first of all, they're, in southwestern terms, they're reasonably large, um, between about 90 and 330 square meters in area. That's about 1,000 to 3,500 square feet. Um, so not chump change. Uh, they are typically at least a little bit semi-subterranean. By that I mean that people excavated some depth of big square hole uh, and built up from it. They tend to have entrances, um, elaborate, elaborated ramped entrances that face east or southeast. And they have a particular set of floor features including really big informal hearths. Um, this can be just a, a basin shaped or a burned area. And uh, big linear pits uh, that we would call floor drums or, or floor vaults. Uh, they may not actually be used as floor drums. But all of these things set great kivas apart from room block space at the same sites. Um, you figure by this point in time, people are living in above ground rooms, they, which are much smaller. They don't have external entrances. They have different kinds of hearths. Uh, at the same time, so Again, I'm broadly dealing with what might be called the Pueblo period. That is, after people have moved into above ground architecture. But great kivas clearly have a pit house period past. Um, they, they look like great kivas that are built in the pit house period. And in much more general terms, they're big pit houses. Um, so in a lot of ways, they're really clearly referring back. Uh, they're really clearly conservative in a way. So, in, into a rapid Great Kiva history. Um, so, 
At the beginning of the time period I'm interested in, so about 1000 CE, this is about the time that people are beginning to build above ground architecture in this area. Um, in the eastern Mogollon Highlands, uh, and also the Point of Pines area, you will see one great kiva associated with a small site um, amid a cluster of other small sites. Um, Reason we're talking, you know, 10 rooms, a site that has a couple of households, a cluster of other small settlements that have a couple of households. Moving through time, um, by the time you get to the late 1100s into the 1200s, people are living in larger sites, uh, and there are a great many great kivas um, in the eastern Mogollon Highlands. There are only a few of them picked out on the map there. So there, so you have a really dense concentration of these in the eastern Mogollon Highlands. Um, they're pretty clearly still drawing an audience from beyond the site itself. Now, by, the, by 1300 or so, people are leaving the eastern Mogollon Highlands. Um, this is part of the very large population shifts that characterize that time period in the southwest. Uh, and one place we think they go is the upper Little Colorado. Uh, the Great Kivas in the Upper Little Colorado start being built in, um, in the 1200s. And there are actually a lot of interesting differences in the Upper Little Colorado Great Kivas. Um, they have benches, and they're larger. And I'm going to come back to what I think uh, might be the significance of these differences shortly. Um, the other late manifestation, so in the, th in the 1300s, you see these Great Kivas being built at sites, at, at Grasshopper, um, at Kanishpa, so at these really big sites uh, in the Arizona Highlands, the Arizona Transition Zone. And these are much larger sites, 500 to 800 rooms. And unlike the Great Kivas anywhere else, these are fully enclosed in the room blocks. So that's a big change. Inside the room blocks. So instead of having a, a separate Great Kiva that you could walk all the way around and walk into, you have essentially a really enormous room um, inside a very big room block. So they are, they're inaccessible in a way that they weren't before, um, both physically and visually. So that's another big change. Now, you can certainly consider the Upper Little Colorado a borderland. Um, this is actually where the rectangular and circular Great Kiva traditions bump into one another. And we know there's an enormous amount of social variability between sites there um, during the 1200s and through to the 1400s. And again, um, in these really big sites in the Arizona mountains, we have lots of evidence for social diversity. Um, some of the, the most famous examples of migration in the Southwest uh, if you look at Point of Pines, where, again, it was the gold standard for, for southwestern migration for years. And you see, at all these sites, you see evidence in pottery manufacture, in the architecture, in the human remains. It's pretty clear that people from the northern southwest moved into these really large settlements below the rim. So again, area that's not necessarily so much a borderland, but definitely a situation of, of culture contact or a lot of social diversity. So, take home messages. Great Kivas in the Eastern Mogollon Highlands, slightly later in some of the big sites in the Highlands, slightly later in the Upper Little Colorado. Both of those sets of Great Kivas are kind of strange, and both of them are associated with social diversity. So where does Fornholt fit into all of this? Well, again, we're at the, uh, the opposite side, the far end of the Great Kiva distribution. Um, and there are a lot of ways in which Mule Creek and the Upper Gila really look like a borderland through time. Um, it's positioned between what's going on in the Eastern Mogollon Highlands and what's going on in the Members Valley. Now, during the 1200s, the time period that I'm particularly interested in, we, and we are pretty certain that the occupation of Fornholt that we're interested in dates to the 1200s. Uh, this is based on both radiocarbon dating and on the ceramics from the site. During that time period, the upper, uh, the upper Gila itself seems really thinly populated. Um, there are people at Fornholt and at some other sites in Mule Creek. Um, there are people uh, to the east and, the, and southeast in the Members Valley and in the New Mexico Boot Heel, but the upper Gila itself is really pretty thinly used during that time. So 
in a way, Fornholt is sitting on what might be considered the, the edge of a frontier. Um, and there are a lot of things that are interesting about Fornholt in light of that. I'm not going to talk much about um, the site other than the Great Kiva tonight, but um, when you look at the room blocks at the site, they look a lot like sites to the north in the eastern Mogollon Highlands. Um, we call this the, the, the Tularosa phase up there. It looks decently like a Tularosa phase site in its architecture, in its site layout, in the features in its rooms. Uh, and it does have the diagnostic painted pottery that we expect in Tularosa phase sites, but it has it in really small numbers, really small, like less than 1% of the total assemblage. It was a joy to analyze, let me tell you. Um, it also has a small amount of ceramics that are really clearly being imported from across that borderland. Uh, types that were made in southern New Mexico or southeastern New Mexico. And these are types that you don't find in Tularosa Face sites farther to the north. And actually, it looks like they're making their plainware pottery, at least their, their corrugated pottery, kind of differently too. Um, and I'm not going to go into that tonight, for which we can all be grateful. Uh, <laughs> but that, that's based on a, a quantitative analysis of lots and lots and lots of corrugated sherds. Um, the best kind of analysis. So, okay, so even before we get to the Great Kiva, Fornholt's in kind of an ambiguous position in relation to, to its neighbors, to the, to the sites to the north. Uh, and it turns out that the Great Kiva is also eccentric. Uh, it's the right shape. Uh, it's, a rec it's, it's a lovely rectangular structure with an entrance that points uh, to the east, southeast or so. It was obviously excavated a little bit below ground surface. So it's the right shape, it's the right form. We don't know if it has the right floor features because we didn't do that much excavation in it. Um, and there, there are a couple of reasons behind that. First of all is that we try and operate always within a preservation ethic and disturb any site we're working at as little as possible and get as much information out of as as much information out of as little disturbance as we can. And the other reason is pure practicality. Uh, these are really big structures, and trying to dig any part of it will give you an absolute appreciation for the people who dug them in the first place with digging sticks and baskets. Uh, so but what we do know from excavating it is that it doesn't seem to have had a roof. Uh, we expect, when we dig these things, to find um, some layer of compact material, some evidence of a compact roof, even if all the woods rotted away. And the Fort Hill Great Kiva just really doesn't seem to have that. Uh, it's also surrounded by the room block. It's not part of the room block. It doesn't actually share the walls. And there's a map of the Fort Hill Great Kiva on the, the back of your handout. Um, so you can see that it's sort of surrounded by the room block without being part of the room block. And actually, the northern extension seem that, that's, that's adjacent to the room block seems to have been planned and never finished. Uh, when we tested a corner of that space, we basically just found wall stubs. We didn't find a floor. We didn't find enough collapsed masonry for there to have been real rooms there. So the position of the Great Kiva itself seems to have been in flux within the site. Um, there are a couple of central pits, really interesting stuff surrounding them, and one of them might be in a position to have been intended to be a post hole, uh, but if it was, it was definitely never used as one. So definitely some ambiguity in the Fornholt Great Kiva's architecture too. Now, I said I wasn't going to talk much about collections tonight, uh, but I do want to say that the collection from Fornhold's Great Kiva does tie it to other Great Kivas in interesting ways. Um, first, we found an archaic or early agricultural dart point, a San Pedro point, uh, sitting on the floor in the center of the Great Kiva. Um, and it turns out, uh, based on going and looking at a bunch of collections and a bunch of records, that 
these show up in a lot of rectangular great kivas and actually in some circular great kivas on the southern Colorado Plateau as well. Um, this really seems to be a, a widely spread practice. We also have a fragment of a pinched clay quadruped effigy. Um, that sounds very technical, but I don't know what it's meant to be. It has little pointy ears and an open mouth, so it could be a, a dog or a mountain lion or who knows. Um, it's pretty adorable, though. Uh, but it turns out, too, that these, uh, effig these, these pinched clay effigy pieces are also enormously common in rectangular great kivas. I think every assemblage that I looked at had them. Um, and I should say, you know, the, the question that immediately comes up is, is this just something that turns up in trash? They are broken. Um, the one we have from Fornholt is the only one from the site. Um, and it's only one of two from all the work we did in Mule Creek, period. So, they're not that common. And finally, um, and as somebody who also works with ceramics, I think this is really pretty cool, uh, it looks like they're specifically selecting rare or unusual ceramics to put in the Great Kiva. Uh, there's, there's a pile of sherds in the central area of, of the Great Kiva, and it has an unusually high concentration of those tuberosa phase diagnostics that I said were so rare, so this pottery that's imported from the north. Um, it has types that are also imported from elsewhere. Uh, it has the, the, the only sherd of a type called Three Rivers red on terracotta from the site, which is a beautiful rim sherd. Um, and this is made to, to reasonably far to the east. Um, and it also has some sherds of a type that probably predates the Great Kiva significantly. And it turns out my, my data on this from other Great Kivas is not as good because of how they, variations in how they were excavated. But this also seems to be a pattern. Um, this holds up in a lot of other great kivas, that there are at least hints that the sherds that they're putting in there, which we might think of as just trash, it's just broken pottery, um, really have some meaning and are really being chosen for a specific, uh, for some specific association. So, okay, so in its assemblage, the Fornhold Great Kiva fits in with things up north, more or less. Um, Okay, so let me return to, uh, I, I mentioned briefly that the great kivas in the upper little Colorado and in those late sites in the Arizona highlands are unusual. So let me return a little bit um, to borderland variability there. So I'm gonna leave, leave Fort Holt for the time being with the overall impression of it being ambiguous and kind of strange. Um, the strangeness that we see in the upper little Colorado so I mentioned benches. Basically all the upper little Colorado great kivas that we know of have benches. And practically none of the great kiva, rectangular great kivas elsewhere have them. Um, this really sets that area apart. And it really looks like something that could be borrowed from the circular great kiva tradition. Um, this may be something that's flowing across social boundaries. Okay, so that's interesting. Uh, they also have, and you can see the, the, the rather grainy map of Hooper Ranch on your, your handout um, shows the bench and also a feature which is, has been interpreted as either an altar or a deflector. Um, these are large linear masonry constructions which are placed between the entryway and the hearth. Um, and again, everywhere we can see that part of an Upper Little Colorado Great Kiva, they have these. Um, People have suggested that's something else that's borrowed from circular great kivas, but the circular great kivas in that part of the world don't have them. Um, they do show up in Chaco Canyon, but they're even a little bit different there. So this looks a lot more like borderland experimentation to me. Uh, and finally, what I think may be, well, no, I won't say it's the most interesting, but another very interesting change is that the great kivas in the upper little Colorado are clearly larger than the ones in the Eastern Mogollon Highlands, um, their, their neighbors and predecessors. So they've decided to build bigger great kivas as well as, their, as, well as great kivas they're experimenting with. Um, and again, I mentioned, I'm, I'm glossing over the, the Arizona Highlands great kivas a little bit because they're, they're farther outside my area of expertise. 
But again, let me reiterate that those are experimental uh, in the sense that they are, for the first time, built within room blocks. Uh, at Great Kiva, or at Great Kiva, at Grasshopper, starts with the same sound, at Grasshopper, and probably at Kanishpa, um, they're experimental in the sense that there weren't great kivas there before, so building it at all is an experiment. Um, and none of them have quite the same set of floor features. So these are, um, these are sort of loose and changing, um, as well as being very enormous spaces and spaces which are enclosed and private in a way um, that great kivas elsewhere have not been. Um, and Stephanie Wilsey and J.J. Reed have been kicking around this idea in some past papers as well. So you see um, this privacy that you have never seen in these areas before. Okay, so we have three borderland or culture contact areas. And all of them have great kivas that are different from great kivas in the eastern Mogollon Highlands in I really don't want to call that area a core because nobody has ever thought that the Eastern Mugion Highlands dominated anything ever. But maybe a region interior, um, the good old fashioned heartland of rectangular great kivas, for, this, for the sake of this presentation anyway. Um, so we have three interesting borderland or culture contact areas. It would be possible to interpret all of this um, and it start, starting in 81,000 to interpret this entire history and the borderlands through the lens of integration. And in fact, it has been done. Um, when you go back and you look at those 81,000 great kivas in the Eastern Mogollon Highlands, remember I said there's one great kiva uh, per cluster of little bitty sites. And that looks like the poster child for integration, right? Um, but at the same time, I think it, will benefit from asking, well, what does it mean that it's associated with one small site um, out of all of them? What does that say about who has the right and the ability to recruit the labor to build this thing? Um, the right and the ability to host events there? Who has the responsibility for its upkeep? Who has the right to attend? When you see them associated with bigger sites in the same area, and there are an awful lot of them, I'm sure they're still drawing an, uh, an audience from beyond the site. And in fact, are they competing for audiences? There are an awful lot of them. So when we get to these borderlands settings, um, take the upper little Colorado, we have this evidence for, okay, okay so we have, we have a feature at least that's pretty clearly flowing across social boundaries. They've, they've borrowed benches. But at the same time, the fact that they're building rectangular great kivas at all is making a statement about their, hist their connection to, w to one another, their possible history in the Eastern Mogollon Highlands. Uh, the fact that these great kivas are even bigger than they were before. If you look at the great kiva at Casa Malpais, it's what I would consider overbuilt um, and had massive walls. And that really suggests to me an emphasis placed on the process of building this thing, of saying, you know, we can get the people together, we can build something truly humongous. Uh, so, are these drawing people together across social boundaries? It's certainly possible. It's absolutely possible that they were meant to do that, whether they were successful or not. But I would argue that at the same time, they're referencing an existing conservative tradition, and if they're trying to bring people together, they're also trying to frame it very much on their own terms. If you look at the great kivas in the Arizona Highlands, at Grasshopper, Point of Pines, Point of Pines especially, you have a situation where you may have um, newcomers jostling with first comers for position within a site. Right? That's sort of the famous Point of Pines narrative that's now sort of being challenged. But so you have, at, at Point of Pines, you can even say that the Great Kiva is part of a really long history. Um, and it's really big, but it might not be big enough to fit everybody in that 800 room site into it. And it's inaccessible in a way that other Great Kivas aren't. This really starts to look to me like maybe this is meant 
maybe this is not meant to bring together uh, the entire site. Maybe this is really meant to, to serve a portion of the site. Maybe this is involved in negotiations of power inside the settlement. So coming back to Fort Holt and the Upper Gila, we have all that ambiguity. We have um, the position of the Great Kiva itself and the site is in flux. It may be unroofed because there wasn't enough labor in that valley to go do such a thing. Um, this, uh, this kind of thing takes a massive amount of work. It's a pretty decent walk to the nearest ponderosa pines or trees of any decent size now. At the same time, it may not be roofed because they failed to recruit the laborer. There, the people may have been there. So I think it's perfectly possible that the great Kiva at Fornholt was actually uh, a bone of contention at the site. The people disagreed about what the structure should be, whether it should be there at all. So I, I do think, so Fornholt's great Kiva was clearly used. Um, there are multiple floors uh, that we could see when we excavated in, in the, the edges, were protected by the wall fall. Um, I think it was, based on the stuff in the center of the Great Kiva, I think it was purposefully retired, um, and retired with some consideration. The end of the Fornholt site itself is interesting because we have evidence for catastrophic burning, uh, both from one room that we excavated and based on a journal from uh, the Cosgroves who visited in the 1920s um, and said that there were multiple rooms that had been absolutely torched and were full of burned corn. So the end of the Fornholt occupation itself uh, may say something about the potential for disagreements and for instability and even danger in borderland situations. So to bring it back to what I asked at the beginning, think about what religion does, and it's a trick question. I think we'll really benefit from considering that religion doesn't necessarily do one thing, and religion doesn't necessarily mean one thing, and it can mean multiple things and do multiple things at the same time. So if we can let go of this sort of blanket approach, um, it may tell us something about not just great kivas, but how religious architecture, um, religion in small scale societies in general, played out and was involved in people's lives and how people made their history. So thank you, and I would love to take questions now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that was great, and I would like you to go back to a fundamental and sure. help better define for me Borderland between what and what? Who and who? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm your major professor. We <laughs> talked about this. <laughs> well, if you'd read my chapter. Um, so if we think of a borderland as a place where people with uh, very diverse social connections and from different social backgrounds meet, um, in the Upper Little Colorado, you have, and, and, of, and of course, you layer history on top of this and people are always moving, um, as heaven knows, as we know in the Southwest. Um, but essentially, if you have, um, from my point of view, if you have a place where over time, you really seem to see two, um, two social groups or two, very different patterns meeting or overlapping, you probably have something like a borderland. Um, does, does that make sense? Yeah, it, it actually answers, you probably do. I don't think <laughs> you have anything stronger than probably. It's, it's <laughs> um, I think there's, there's good evidence based on, in, in these particular areas, I think there's good evidence for differing traditions existing. Um, but, um, and this is based on, uh, being the Southwest, a lot of it's based on pottery. Um, but different, different kinds of pottery manufacture, um, manufacture different types of pottery. Uh, in the Upper Gila, you have sort of a, um, a long-term difference uh, 
both in um, what pottery people are making and also in settlement layouts. So the, the upper Gila looks very much like part of the members' classic tradition um, right up until sometime in the, in the 1100s when um, most of the upper Gila empties out. And at Fornholt, you have, I think, actually the descendants of people who had been participating in members' stuff um, now sort of participating in Eastern Mugion Highlands stuff. Um, so, but yes, I, I, I will always hedge with a probably. <laughs> Another question. My question is simple. Um, I was wondering if you could, uh, I, was, I was hoping you could explain perhaps um, the difference between the internal unroofed Great Kiva at Fornholt with what others have called walled-in plazas? Uh, sure. The biggest difference um, is that, and th we affectionately called this thing a pleva for years, um, the biggest difference is that the Fornholt structure has its own walls. Um, it, instead of using, instead of being a space that's defined by the walls of the room block itself, uh, it pretty clearly has um, separate distinct walls, uh, which we didn't actually know until we started excavating it. Also, um, it is excavated below the ground surface, so it would have been, even if you compared it to the, uh, to the level of the floor in the rooms around it, it would have been sunken. Um, it's not hugely deep, but it is excavated, which kind of raises the question of, you know, how awful having a big unroofed pit is when it rains and fills up with water. Um, and it may, we have little dinky post holes in a couple of places around the edges, so it's possible it had some kind of light awning or some kind of informal roofing. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with it being a great Kiva-like thing, um, both because it has separate walls, it's semi-subterranean, and it has that big entrance. Okay, next question. Could you talk a little bit more about the fact that the Kiva was burnt and whether that's a typical way to uh, end this story with Kivas, or is that unusual? Well, it's interesting. So our great Kiva at Fornholt was not, or at least not that we can tell. Um, because we don't have any effort, uh, evidence for roofing, and because um, the substrate there is so orange, so it sort of already looks oxidized anyway, um, I, I don't think Fornholt, the Fornholt Great Kiva was burned, but if it had been, if there had been a little bit of burning, I don't know that we could tell. But the burning of Great Kivas in retirement is very, very common. Um, uh, beyond uh, just the great kivas that I'm talking about. But um, yeah, of the, of the ones that I went back and looked at records or collections, um, I actually found it difficult to confirm. that. Basically, I have ones that are burned and ones that I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> so burning was very, very common um, as just a way of retiring these things. Um, and it's always difficult when you have, and, and I absolutely believe it was part of retiring them, um, when you have burning at sites in general, um, I typically, despite what I just said, I, I typically am part of the faction who don't like to jump to the conclusion that it's um, warfare or violence. Or, but the fact that we have multiple burned rooms at Fornholt, um, and it's really hard to set a Pueblo room on fire and keep it burning. Um, and the fact that they're full of burned corn, and the one that we excavated is full of stuff. Um, the, the floor assembly seems to have been intact when it collapsed down into the lower story room. Um, that says to me that it's probably purposeful, and I lean toward thinking that it wasn't um, sort of peaceable retirement. But it, it's certainly possible that people were moving a long way away, and either it was a way of closing it down, or they wanted to make sure nobody could use their stuff. Well, obviously, as you have said, there are thousands of these kivas with corners 
how do their numbers compare to the round kivas in uh, other pueblos? Um, I don't know that there are thousands. Um, actually, I'm pretty sure there aren't thousands. There, okay. Um, you know, it's really hard to know what the total numbers are. There are probably, I, 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 I would guess it's, you know, Well, no, you more, no more than a couple hundred through time. For would you rec- say there's far more square and rectangular kivas than there are round or just the ballpark um, idea? I think round great kivas cover a... Hmm, it's less my territory. I think round great kivas may cover a larger territory. Okay. So during the same time period, um, there may total be more circular great kivas. But it's, it's, it's difficult to know because right. we sort of, we just have, we have these windows on where, where the research yeah, has been done. Yeah, you're working in one area. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. We've got a question here. If it's so, hello, uh, got it. Okay. If it's so hard to burn these things down, mm-hmm. and if you looked at the large kiva being burnt and some rooms, mm-hmm. what did they burn it with? And how come not all the bur- rooms were burnt? Um, that is a good question. Uh, so interestingly, the great kivas, and as I said, our great kiva isn't burned, um, possibly there's nothing to burn. Um, the great kivas that are burned, um, often don't seem to be wor- burned tremendously well. Uh, this is, as, it's interesting, as, as comparison to, um, so I have, I've, not really discuss the Pitas period at all. There are late Pitas period great kivas in, um, in the upper Gila in the members area and people um, in this room and elsewhere know much more about them than I do. But th- and these, these were uh, re- often retired by really catastrophic burning. Um, it's my, my understanding anyway, I, I could be wrong about the level of burning. Um, I, I think speaking to the fact that these things are difficult to burn is the fact that they seem to be sort of burned you know, you'll have um, some charcoal on the floor. You have sometimes the preserved post ends, but compared to um, really um, big stacks of charcoal from really violent burning, um, I don't think we're present, based on the collections and the records I looked at, I don't think we're present in these rectangular great kivas. But as you say, if you're going to set something on fire and one of these structures on fire, and particularly the masonry rooms on fire, you really have to have some kind of fuel or accelerant. Um, I'm, uh, I'm honestly not sure what you would use ex- as accelerant. Pine might work. People at the, the U of A and elsewhere have studied this. Uh, in these particular rooms, um, there's an, an, at, at Fornholt, there was enormous amount of corn. Um, and I suspect the corn was the primary fuel. Um, and it was dry enough to burn well. And it's, so we just have these huge hunks of fused corn on the cob. Um, so I think that was probably a primary fuel there. But yeah, they, um, to the best of my knowledge, in order to really uh, get these rooms to burn and get more than one room to burn because the fire doesn't spread well at all. Um, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right that you need some kind of fuel um, and some kind, and maybe some kind of accelerant if you can manage it. So. Okay, we have a question over here. I'm looking at your map that says transition zone, which I think is the area you're referring to in, with, in your talk. What kind of land management is around all these sites? Are they vulnerable? Are they semi-protected? I mean, what can you say about how did you get access? What, what's going on in the land management that's maybe not tied directly to the archaeological oh. site? Thank you for asking, because that's a really good question. Um, this, the, the whole area encompasses a, an, an interesting mix of land ownership. A lot of the upper Gila is private. Uh, when we worked on Fornholt, the owners of the site very graciously trusted us um, to work on their land. A lot of the Eastern Mogollon Highlands um, is forest land. Uh, and in that sense, it's protected by ownership, but it's also pretty difficult to protect. Um, it, it, can, it can be pretty difficult to protect sites that are very rural. <laughs> um, so 
there's always been some illegal looting on the forest, but the sites are protected there in that sense. Um, the three big sites um, that I mentioned in the Arizona transition zone are on reservations. So Point of Pines is on the San Carlos Reservation. Uh, Kanishba and Grasshopper are on the Fort Apache, the, the White Mountain Apache Reservation. Um, and I, the Tribal Historic Preservation Offices take very seriously the protection of those sites. Um, Kanishba has an interesting history because it, uh, when it was dug in the 30s, the uh, excavator, um, Byron Cummings of the University of Arizona really wanted it to be a national park, or you know, some kind. So, um, so it was sort of semi-reconstructed, um, and it, his, his dream never came through. But you, um, more recently, uh, the tribe has um, put together enough of a visitorship program that you can go out and see Kanishba. So it's a really incredible spot. Um, when I was a field school student, I stuffed mud into the walls of Kanishba. <laughs> um, so, and finally, the Upper Little Colorado, um, I believe, has more private land. Some of the great kivas, um, Rudd Creek is on game and fish land, I think. So it's a, a sort of patchwork you see up there. But I know a, a lot of them are on, are on private land. On your map of the Fornholt uh, Great Kiva, there's a number of lines that look like they're circular. Is that um, is there a possibility that there was a great a circular great kiva there, or what are all the nice little lines? Oh, um, so that's um, yeah. I should have put a contour interval. So those are twenty centimeter contour intervals. Um, so yes, absolutely, it looks like a circular depression. Um, but really, and unfortunately, unfortunately, you can't see our units on that map. Um, but it, basically due to square holes collapsing and looking circular. Um, so, yeah, no, when the, I said the, the Cosgroves visited the site, site in the 20s, they, they actually said there was a big circular depression. Um, so, you know, that's, that's how they fill in. Uh, but yeah, but you're, you're absolutely right. It, it makes it, it can make it quite difficult to tell on the surface. Um, one of the things you haven't mentioned tonight is how spectacular Fornholt is. Um, having been there, I vote it in one of my top five most spectacular sites in the Southwest because the great kiva that she shows here is at the top of a hill, and you walk up to the top of the hill, and there's this huge <laughs> hole in the ground at the top of the hill. So my question to you is, you, you said that this was kind of contested, that there may have been different groups mm -hmm. and they may have been fussing around about what they should build or what mm -hmm. they shouldn't build, but they built it in the most spectacular place around, on purpose, of course, mm -hmm. um, and they must have agreed about that. Or somebody outvoted everybody else. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I thank you on behalf of my site. Um, <laughs> No, it's, it's an incredible spot. Um, I think, so it's interesting. Um, in addition to uh, the, the occupation that, you know, that I'm particularly interested in, um, the Fornholt site has a really deep history. Um, so there's, a, there's clearly a late pithouse period settlement there. There's probably actually an early pithouse period settlement there too. Uh, but the late Pithouse period settlement had clearly had a rectangular Great Kiva. Um, we tested this just to make sure that it didn't date to the time period we're interested in. Um, so we've seen about that much of the floor of it, um, and quite a bit of the entryway. Uh, and it's smack dab between the two late room blocks. Um, so, and there was use of the site in the. 1000s or even into the 1100s too, and there's actually um, adobe architecture underneath the masonry architecture in the southern room block, um, like actually built up from the wall stubs. So this is a very roundabout way of answering this question, but bear with me. Um, so I think the situation of the site itself was really drawing on that deep history. Um, and so I think the, the fact that the site was there at all um, is in some way drawing on that deep history. Um, 
And I kind of feel that the, the position of the great Kiva was sort of related to the site being already there. Um, but you're absolutely right that it, the fact that they got it built at all, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a very big space that involved a substantial amount of moving material. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't, don't want to imply that the Fornhold Great Kiva was a failure. Um, <laughs> but um, I think there's definitely some, some, some tension or ambiguity there in, in terms of whether we really, really want a Great Kiva and what we want it to be. Um, so, but you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a gorgeous spot. Um, Okay, another question? Yeah. Catherine, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.